Okay, so thank you for inviting me here today to do this keynote. It's actually one of my favorite topics. I'm gonna to talk about keys. Um, and the open authentication standard that enables these keys to work across the internet and keep you safe. And not only you, but actually billions of people today online. So, the first I time that I registered for an online bank, they told me that I would be safe if I used the username and password and um, a software application that I downloaded on my phone. But I happened to know a former white hat hacker who told me that it would take him about a day to write the code that would log in and empty my bank account. So to inform the bank about this risk, I called them up and there was this short, a few seconds of silence before they gave me a very clear response. Can you please tell your friend to not do that? <laughs> no. So what I didn't tell the bank was that the former wine hat hacker is actually my husband, the father of my three children, and, uh, and he never did anything illegal, trust me. Uh, he knew that any software application, independent if it's downloaded on a phone or a computer, will sooner or later be vulnerable for hackers. But the hardware authenticators that was out there at the time were really just too complicated and difficult to scale and deploy. So this discussion with this online bank encouraged me and Jacob to form a company we named it Yubico, and we developed a little login key named the YubiKey with the vision of having a secure login key across all websites, the ubiquitous key. So how would we make this happen? We came up with a business plan. It was very simple. It was just a couple of sentences. We should move to Silicon Valley and work with the internet thought leaders. And so we did. Uh, Google shared with us that one of their biggest threats at the time was phishing. Not just the sort of old school phishing trying to steal a username and password, but the more sophisticated modern attacks that hijacks the session. It's called the man in the middle. And for this, they didn't have a solution at the time they had deployed their Google Authenticator, which is a phone app that could mitigate some of this risk, but the worst, most sophisticated attack, this software could not battle. Um, so we started to discuss with them, you know, how they would potentially be able to deploy smart cards. But smart cards that are really secure also comes with the complexity of drivers and client software and readers and CAs, and this was just too big hassle to deploy. And then we came with some ideas on how we could simplify the smart card. And this resulted in FIDO U2F. FIDO U2F is a global authentication standard that um, the way it's set up for Google is exactly how it looks here. You enter a username and password, you insert your key, and then you touch it. And then there are various of designs and versions and vendors that provides different solutions here. And this is from, from Yubico. It's a key that you tap to your phone or a small device that you plug into the USB port. And this is our latest design that fits into the, the new MacBooks. After it was tested by Google, we were invited by a standards organization called FIDO Alliance to continue to develop this as a global standard. And Google do no longer see account takeover from advanced phishing as a problem in their company. So how did we do this? It's from the user, it's just a simple touch. But on behind the scenes, there are a few really important things that make it unfishable. The first thing 
is origin checking. In the protocol, it actually checks that it's the original website that you're trying to connect to. A lot of the modern phishing today, that actually the SMS and the phone apps that you are using cannot battle, is tricking the user to go into a fake website. And it's really difficult for the user to see the difference. And you can't really ask the users to understand the difference. It just has to work. So that is one of the basic pieces of the FIDUTEF protocol. Another new innovative piece is the user presence. I'm touching it. I'm a real human. I'm not a robot remotely trying to hack in. I'm real. And this threat has actually become a real serious threat for a lot of authenticators, including the most high secure smart cards that the government and military is using. And then, the, actually the core innovation behind the protocol, which make it really scalable, is that there are no shared secrets. You can use the key to any number of services, to Google, to Facebook, to Dropbox, to GitHub, to UK government, and none of these services share any of the encryption secrets or any user data. Every time I register a key for a site, it it develops um, a new set of key pairs that is only stored on that service. So then, then when I go to a new site, a new key pair is, is developed that is only stored on that service. And this, I would say, is the core innovation behind this idea, because there's no longer a centralized identity provider, a centralized service, a company, a Google, a Ubico, a whatever that sits and control the data of billions of users and keys that want to log in securely. Um, we're also using the public key crypto, the, you know, the good, inherently good, um, strong authentication that is used. The same technology as you basically use for smart card, uh, but we ha with this new, new twist. And, uh, with public key crypto, you have, don't have one centralized service that can be hacked. And then another really important thing. This could not have happened without Google, without Firefox, and soon without Microsoft. In order to make it really, really easy for the user, so the user don't have to think and don't have to download anything, it just works, we had to have native support in platforms and browsers. And there are two good reasons for this. It's not just the convenience. There is actually a really big risk when you download any software. And we're seeing that today. There is actually large scale software, security software, that you download on your computer with intention to be safe that has malicious code. So we just wanted to avoid that potential opportunity to happen. And the third. The last and really, really as important as everything else, the security is no more secure as its weakest link. A lot of great security products and technologies and inventions sort of fail because, well, you always need a backup. And of course you always need a backup. You can't just have one thing. And the backup often is less secure than the really secure thing. So. Um, what Google realized when they only had their Google Authenticator in their phone, that people actually lost their phone. They, they broke, it, it got lost, it got reset, and then people couldn't log in. With security keys, you can give people multiple. So Google is deploying two or three keys per staff, and with this way, they have been able to cut support in half and save millions of support hours and dollars. Um, Um, I'm just going to share with you here, this is how you, Facebook have implemented it. Facebook said, oh, we're going to make it even more simple than Google. <coughs> Users only have to register once, and then they don't need to touch the key until they move to a new computer or phone. It's a very similar concept or user experience as we have with our SIM cards. You know, we get a SIM card, we put it in the phone, and then we don't touch it until we move to a new device. In this way, we have created a security system that people don't have to think about, they don't actually have to use until they move to a new computer or phone, which they, people don't do so often. Google have set it up that you have to log in every 30 days, uh, which is still really convenient. 
And when I write the whatever identity here, this is a really important aspect. The key is not tied to any means of identity. Google, Facebook, they don't really care who you are. They just want to ensure that you're the right and the same person coming back again. And, and that's why actually the security key is today used by dissidents and journalists around the world who needs to be secure yet anonymous without leaving footprint um, and need to be safe for non-democratic governments. Um, here is a completely different use case. It's actually here in UK, where uh, one of the ident seven identity providers that offers um, secure login to government services, is the company's name is Digi Identity. They have made support for the FIDA U2F key. And how you can use your key combined with ID proofing to actually prove who you are. Not the ID proofing will ensure that you are the right person and the key will definitely ensure that you are the right person. Um, and today, you know, the combination of having um, a key where you don't, I mean, the whole, the whole aspect of having multiple identities have to be the way strong authentication and security have to work. Security cannot always be tied to your really large identity. There are too many use cases where you don't want to and should not leave any means of identity. Uh, I was called, asked the other day, to, okay, so why are we going back to these hardware authenticators in a time of all this sophisticated data and phones and biometrics and big data sensor, why are we back to hardware? And the fact is we never left the hardware. If there had been more secure, easy ways to distribute and revoke <coughs> user identities, we would not have this. SIM cards, credit cards, passports with chips in. Um, there may be a future where we don't need it, but right now, these are things that we've already sort of learned to deal with and keep in our pockets and, and wallets and, and um, phones. Um, I'm just going to share quickly with you how now this standard is evolving since more companies, including Microsoft and Mozilla, are coming on board and they want more features and more use cases. Um, so a user with a, with a phone and computer do some kind of gesture. We started with a pin. In the near future, we can have it with a, a face, with a voice, with a fingerprint, you know, some kind of other user gesture. And then you have an authenticator. And it's not only going to be YubiKeys. It's going, there's already other form factors out there that are integrated. There, some will be integrated directly into computer and phones. Some will be integrated into watches or clocks or whatever. And um, there will be choices. Um, these devices will uh, communicate through different protocols. Uh, the ones we have developed so far in the standard is USB, NFC, and Bluetooth. And now we're building support in the browsers today. It's Chrome, uh, Firefox Beta, uh, Opera, Android, and there are many more to come. And then we got this protocol that allows you to log into any number of services, and the servers they are free, open source. It takes a few days for any online service to make support for this technology. So in your bag today, you got a YubiKey. And we said, OK, so are we only going to focus on this standard and wait for the future when this works everywhere? No, we were pragmatic. We put other protocols on the same key, including other open standards like smart card and one-time password and encryption. So you can use the key for more things. And this is my last slide. Why am I showing this? Silence. Okay, so this is actually an example of a security challenge that our society shared 60 years ago. In the late 50s, we were all excited about the new communication methods. Happy car drivers, they hit the brand new highways, and many of them never came back because there were no seat belts in cars. The other picture to the right shows Niels Bolin, who was the uh, core inventor behind the three-point seat belt. He, at the time, he was a 
um, security engineer at Volvo, and he came to the conclusion around security. It's very similar to the conclusion that Ubico and Google and Facebook have come. In order for security to scale, it has to be really simple. It has to work in a simple gesture in within a second. Ordinary people do not want to be uncomfortable even for a second. And it has to be an open standard. There's no way that people will deploy and accept these things if it's not everywhere. Uh, and when it's everywhere and when it's all over and we don't even have to think about it, then we will have a more secure internet for everyone. Thank you.